Good afternoon and good evening to everyone. My name is Dave Frankowski and I'll be your moderator for today's class. And welcome to another lecture given by the Oceanside California class. This is a school and not a church. Neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. The school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh our Elohim and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given unto our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year of 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year of 1958, and we hold classes in the United States and in various other countries. The Oceanside class was established in 1994. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you the Dean of the Oceanside class, Dr. Dennis Volpe, and the President, Dr. Carl Emler. Now in the school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title for the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The correct name for our Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The correct title for the word or son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. And the correct name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles. They are not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and there are God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike the titles of Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. It's a divine title because it's the title that our Creator has chosen for Himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name, and a minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew, the Greek, nor the Latin languages have any letters or characters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that's made by the letter J. Neither was there a letter J in our own English language until some 1,400 years after the death of the Messiah, which would make such names as Jesus and Jehovah impossible renderings for the true name of our Father and His Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, the limits, and the bounds of everything that exists. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. And we've drawn this cloud to extend all around the edges of this chart to show that everything on the chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Yahweh Elohim. This is the word or son a super incorporeal being, that is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form could only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body, and he walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, who the whole world calls Jesus Christ. Now there's only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. 
So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is, what did they call the Savior when he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface to the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It's the divine pattern because it's Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai, and he showed him this threefold tabernacle pattern in a vision. Later on, Yahweh instructed Moses to build one in the wilderness of Sinai, exactly like the one he had seen in his vision on the mount. The tabernacle pattern is a threefold pattern consisting of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and it operates according to the structure and the function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The school has 10 primary constitutional objectives and aims, and they are as follows. One, to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Two, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Three, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Four, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Five, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seven, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eight, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Nine, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained. There is no other name given among men whereby a man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And ten, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace, and our slogan is speak the truth. We'll begin this afternoon with a prayer by Dr. Rochelle Morgan from our Illinois class, and we'll have a scripture read, which will be Hebrews, the 10th chapter, and that'll be read by Dr. Mike Josephson from our Green Bay, Wisconsin class. Good afternoon, class. Let us all bow our, bow our hearts and minds and give um, this wonderful time that's been allotted to us to learn something more about Yahweh's purpose, pattern, and plans through the speakers, because I believe that the Holy Spirit speaks through vessels. And I hope this is a good class and yashua has got something to share with us. And I ask this in our Savior's name, Yahshua the Messiah. Let us all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll be reading the scripture tonight from the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by A.B. Trina of the Scripture Research Association, Incorporated. Hebrews, the 10th chapter. <clears throat> For the sacrificial law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, 
because the worshipers, once purged, should have no consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sin, sins every year. For it is not impossible, for it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings thou did not desire, mine ears hast thou pierced, burnt offerings and sin offerings hast thou not required. Then I said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O Yahweh. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering, and burnt offerings, even for sin thou wouldest not, neither hath pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O Yahweh. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Yahshua the Messiah, once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of Yahweh, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Spirit also is a witness to us. For after that he hath said before, This is the covenant that I will make with thee, with them after those days, saith Yahweh. I will put my law into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. In their sins and iniquities I'll remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, liberty to enter into the holiest place by the blood of Yahshua, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest, over the house of Yahweh, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner is of some uh, manner is of some is, but ex exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remain no sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking. For, a ju for judgment and fierce indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. How, but of how much sore punishment suppose ye? Shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of Yahweh and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace? For we know him that hath said, Vengeance is mine, I will recompense, says Yahweh. And again, Yahweh shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living Elohim. But call to remembrance the former days, which after ye, after ye were illuminated, ye endured great fight of, of afflictions, 
partly whilst you were made a gazing stop, gazing stock, both by the reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst you became co companions of them that were so used. For you had sympathy with them who were in bonds and took joyfully the spoils of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring su substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of Yahweh, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto per perdition, but them that believe on the saving of the soul. Thank you, Dr. Josephson and Dr. Morgan. Our scripture readers this afternoon will be Dr. Linda Volpe from our Oceanside, California class and Dr. Gail Josephson from our Green Bay, Wisconsin class. And speakers, please be advised, you'll have a five-minute sign appearing on your screen. Please acknowledge when you've seen the sign. And our first speaker this afternoon will be Dr. Patrick Latortu from our Northside Chicago class, and I apologize if I pronounced it wrong. You pronounced it right. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, okay. My first visitation to the Oceanside branch. Just to let you know that the Northside Chicago branch sends its love. And uh, the first speaker you are to give the foundation. So I will do my utter best through Yahshua to give a foundation of of what is in this teaching and what we have been taught. First of all, we need to always remember that this is the divine vision and revelation that was given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. Also, please be reminded that it has been 92 I believe, yeah, 92 years that this vision has manifested itself uh, on this earth plane. So let's begin with Proverbs 28, uh, 29, 18, and then Habakkuk 2 and 2, and then we will get into the fulfillment scriptures from there. Let's start with uh, Pro uh, Proverbs 29, 18, please. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Now but, in the, yeah, yeah, now in the King James Version, you have where there is no vision, the people perish. But if you do have a Holy Name Bible, you will note that where there is no prophetic vision, the people perish. But go ahead. But happy is he that what? But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. So he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Now, Habakkuk 2 and go to Habakkuk 2 and 1, but before that, I think it is Habakkuk 1 and 5 or Habakkuk 1 and 15, where it is that I will work a work in your day, a work that you shall in no wise believe, though a man tell you. Please tell me if I'm accurate. <laughs> I don't know if it's 1 and 5 or 1 and 15. Yep, 1 and 5. Okay. Yes, in Habakkuk. Behold ye among the heathen and regard and wonder marvelously. For I will work a work in your days, which you will not believe, though it be told you. Though it be told you. Even now, even as many, many, those that have been in this school, or those that have been, 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 I, I say, caught by the Holy Spirit, would even tell family members and friends about this stupendous vision and revelation. And there are still many that do not believe this, even at this time. So. Go now to Habakkuk 2 and 1, please. 2 and 1. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say to me and what mm. I shall answer when I am reproved. 
Mm-hmm. And yeah, we answered me and said, write the vision and make, make it plain upon tables that he may run that reads it. He's for gone. the vision. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Not tarry. So that that vision was manifested. Now, this divine vision and revelation is in agreement with what was shown to John on the Isle of Patmos and what was shown to Moses atop Mount Sinai. It is in agreement. And because it is in agreement, it also accompanies with a divine pattern of the universe. This is what is in operation. So because of this pattern it, and through this pattern, you have to remember Elohim transformed into this divine pattern, you understand, so that it is as easy I'll put it like this. It's as easy as one, two, three, A, B, C. And it is the simplicity that is within this divine vision and revelation or in this gospel that one is able to understand who their creator is, who is Yahweh, and his son, Yahshua the Messiah. Now, when Yahshua was manifested on the earth plane, he did not come in to institute any cardinal ordinances that are being attempted to be practiced on this age, the present kingdom age, which is the fourth age. He fulfilled all those things that were written in the law and the testimony, the law being the first five books and the testimony being the next 34 books. And remember that as as he was, as Yahshua the Messiah was walking around the Judean hills He did not have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or any of the other letters. See, he came in to fulfill, complete, bring to an end that that was practiced by the Jews for 1,500 years. So let's get some proof on that. Give me Matthew 5, 17, 18. Give me Luke 24, 25 through 27, and Luke 24, 44. We need to rehearse these things. Go ahead. Matthew 5, 17, please. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. Mm -hmm. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Mm -hmm. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no way pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Just in case we forgot what fulfillment, I know I said it, but I wanted out the dictionary so people don't think I'm just running my mouth. Meanwhile, the next scripture reader, can you please get me Luke 24, 25 through 27, please? And then we'll get the word fulfilled. Yes, Luke 24 and 25. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Yahshua to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So you must remember that the law, which is the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, were not talking about us. They're talking about Yahshua the Messiah himself. The same with the prophets. See? From Joshua to Malachi. They are strictly talking about Yahshua the Messiah. They are not talking about us because he came in to fulfill. We can barely fulfill what we're doing in our day. You understand? But we're talking about him fulfilling so that you may be able to worship our Heavenly Father, what? In spirit and in what? True. Now give me the definition of the word fulfill. And then we'll continue with Luke 24, uh, 44, 45. I have the definition of fulfill from the Webster's Merriman Webster Dictionary and Thesaurus. It oh, is yeah. to, to put into effect, to yeah. bring to an end. Bring to an end, read. To meet the requirements of, satisfy, satisfy, satisfy read. 
accomplish, achieve, accomplish, achieve, read, carry out, commit, compass, do, execute, follow through, make, perform, hmm. answer, comply, fill. <laughs> I love this. Go ahead. It goes on and on. <laughs> yeah. I, is there a definition that to, to bring to reality? Is that in there? Uh, yeah, I can't. No, not, in, not okay. in this one. I'm not seeing okay. it. Now. I, that, that long ago when I first came in the class, that was one of those definitions as well. To bring into reality. See? And what is being brought into reality? is for you to worship our Heavenly Father, Yahweh, in what? In spirit and in what? Truth. See, there's many other organizations that have the name of Yahweh and Yahshua. But this requirement is necessary because he's looking for the, you know what, I'm running my mouth again. Give me Luke 24, 44, and then give me John 4, 21 through 25. I mean, 4, 21 through 24. And then we'll go back to Moses if we can. Go ahead. Luke 24, 44. Please. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were writ written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Concerning who again? Concerning me. Who said he that? Said, Yahshua. Oh, thank you very much. So Yahshua said, can you read the next verse, please? 45. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. So hold up. Who's opening their understanding? Yeshua. Oh, okay. So I can't make you understand anything. Right. Neither you can make me understand anything. Mm -hmm. He has to open your heart and mind. So you may understand this divine vision and revelation or that that is written in the law and in the testimony. See, you understand? Now I need John 4, 21 through 25. I mean, 24, please. I keep saying 25. I just want 21 through 24, please. John. Okay. Okay. 21. Yahshua saith unto her, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Hmm. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what yeah, we no, worship. No, no, for we don't. Let's, let's not run too fast. Now, you, you read that read that part one more time. You read that part one more time. Go ahead. Uh, ye worship, ye know not what. Stop. Right there. Now, you know. No one has to write anybody a letter about anything. We didn't know what we were worshiping. We had a plenty of imagination where we thought God was up above the sun, moon, and stars sitting in a chair somewhere with a big old white beard. See? And people are about to celebrate this daggone thing called Christmas. You understand? That has nothing to do with the scriptures itself. But that was a serious imagination and a tradition that still goes on today. We didn't know what we worship and what Eternal life is to know the only true Elohim and what? Yahshua the Messiah whom thou hast sent. That's what it says in John 17 and 3. Say, but go ahead, keep reading in John 4 chapter. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know yeah. what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So see, he had to remove the law and the testimony because the Jews, because that's what he came in to do, to save them from their what? Their sin. See? So let's go back to Moses as instructed in the in the scripture. See? Let's find Yahshua the Messiah. Oh, you know what? <laughs> I should do this. Give me John 145, please. I should do this. Make sure we understand. John, you want John 145? Yep. Yes, I do. Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Yahshua of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Wait a minute. They wrote of him? Mm -hmm. Uh-oh, that was written in the law and the testimony. So let me try this for a moment. I know I'm 
I just got distracted. Here we go. What was the what is the Elohim, the archetype, original pattern of the universe about? Who did who did Dr. Kenley write about? Yeah, oh. Sure. Oh. oh, really? Cool. Now, who did John on the Isle of Patmos write about? Yeshua. Yeah, sure. Uh-oh. Who did Moses write about? Yeshua. Yeah, sure. Do you see? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, do, we have a, do we have a running principle running around here? They wrote of Yahshua the Messiah. See? So see, we are not here to glorify ourselves. We're not here to pat our pat yourselves on the back and say that was a fantastic lecture. No. They wrote about Yahshua the Messiah. So who are we to look to? Uh-oh. See, I can't even do this right. Give me Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, then I'll try to go back to Moses. Please. <laughs> Boy, I can't even do that yet. Go ahead. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 specifically. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin with, which doth so easily beset us, and let mm -hmm. us run with patience the race that is set before us, mm -hmm. looking, looking unto Yahshua, the author and finisher of our faith. Stop! Stop! We said the letter to the Hebrews, right? 12th chapter, right? Yes. And Yahshua the Messiah said, now, 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 I'm talking about Paul now. Paul said, Yahshua being the author and the what? Finisher. Uh-oh. That, that sounds familiar. Uh-oh. That means he finished fulfilling the law. Didn't he not say that on the cross that the work was what finished? Just like Moses back in the law, when he put up, the, when he reared up the tabernacle saying that it, the work was what? Finish? You understand? Mm -hmm. See? Same principle. Just pay attention. Sure. We are his workmanship, and you know he's about to finish this work. You understand? See? So, Yahshua the Messiah being the what? Author and finisher of our faith, read. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of Yahweh. Stop right there. There was a joy that was set before him. What is that joy? People, there was good news behind it. He endured everything. He endured 40 lashes. He endured the nails, the crown of thorns on his head, the nails in the feet, typifying him being the lamb of Yahweh who's taken away the what? Sins of the world. There was a joy that was set before him that he would be what? Resurrected. Why do you think we come to this? Why do we come to class, people? Uh-oh, I can't even get through this yet. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the what? The gospel or the good news. Read if someone has it. Yep, 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, yes. brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand. You have received it and wherein you stand. Standing where? In the holy place. Read. By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. Unless so that you means, have... wait, 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 wait. So that means if you're standing in the holy place, that means you've been saved. Look at your pattern. Mm -hmm. Ark of the cup, the ark of the cup, the ark, the altar of sin sacrifice represents the death. Mm -hmm. The brazen labor represents the burial. And please remember that the cup of anointing oil was given to the priest to be anointed at the door which represents the fourth step. You're in the fourth age. What do you think is going on? Pentecost is still going. You're being anointed. Oh, man, I'm getting into something deep. Go ahead, keep reading before I get totally distracted. Go ahead. Two, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, Please. unless you... 
Unless you have believed in vain. Unless you believe this was worthless and fruitless. Unless you have believed this whole thing is in vain. That's a dangerous thing to think about, especially as close to us being at the nearing the universal revelation of Yahshua the Messiah. For I delivered unto you, first of all, read. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Yahshua died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. People, when this whole thing, there's a joy. As there was a joy that was set before him, there's a joy that is also set before us if you are a son of Yahweh. That you're going to resurrect out of this foolishness that's going on on this earth plane. Believe me, there's plenty of it. And there's only one thing we can look at is the Messiah himself, who is the resurrection and the life. I have yet to go back to Moses. So you know what? Let me go back to Moses. You understand? See, because as Moses was what? Born during the time of a death decree because the second Pharaoh that knew not Joseph did, did not know of what Joseph had done and was fearful of the what? He was fearful of the, of, of the children of Israel multiplying so much and they would thought that another nation would join in and they would overcome them. So he declared a, the death of the what? Boy, a Hebrew boy baby. You understand? He didn't want them to multiply. What? Uh-oh. How did Yahshua fulfill that? Yahshua was born during the time of a what? Death decree. You understand? When those, when those magi came over to see him. You understand what I'm saying? And then Herod was the one that declared uh, 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 death uh, 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 to, those, to those boys in Bethlehem two years and what? Two years and under. You understand? See how Yahshua is fulfilling it? Moses was born full of the Holy Spirit. Why? It says in the scriptures that Moses was a goodly child. Now, you know every mother thinks that their child is goodly, but this particular, but this written in the scriptures just that way to reveal that he was the, what, that he was the first prophet, what? Under the law, born with the Holy Spirit, just as John the Baptist being the last prophet under the law. You understand? In the prophecy, before the coming of what? Yahshua the Messiah. You understand? See, I don't want to get into all that right now. I got to concentrate on this. Give me the third chapter of uh, 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 Exodus, please. Because, see, after Moses, after Moses, what? Uh, 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 when he was 40 years old, see, in Pharaoh's daughter's household, in Pharaoh's household, you understand? He knew the traditions and the customs of the Egyptians. You understand? Then he came out at the age of 40. There's a 40 involved in the pattern, see? See? You understand? He came out, saw an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, and so he looked this way and that, and he killed the Egyptian, buried him in the sand. That's a death. That's a burial. That was day one. Day two, he comes out, and he sees two Hebrews uh, uh, quarreling among each other. And they, one of them said, are you a prince or a judge over us? As you, did you, are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian the other day? You understand? That's, uh-oh, uh that's day two. Did Moses leave on day two? Oh, no, he didn't. He went back into the house. And on the third day, what? He resurrected, see, out of that household and went into the land of what? Land of Midian. What? That's typifying Yahshua's death, his burial, and what? Resurrection on the third day. That's when Moses resurrected on the third day. You understand? See? And he, then he intercessed for those women, you understand, uh, uh, that were watering the flock. And they brought, and they came home early. And Moses, and they said an Egyptian helped us. Moses was wearing Egyptian clothes when he fleed on out of there. Now give me the third chapter of Exodus, please. Starting at one? Yes, please. And I read it out of the King James. That, 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 okay. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. 
And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. Mm. And Moses said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. Mm. And when the Lord saw that he turned to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, uh -huh. here am I. Here am I. Now stop right there. Now see, you see all this confusion going on. Mm -hmm. The Lord, which is an English title, Master Ruler. You got God, which is stemming from, which is stemming from the what? German. Can you hear me? Yeah. I may have lost. You're still nope. You're still there. Oh, good. Because I just dropped something. So anyway. That's a German deity. And then when you investigate Jesus Christ, that's a triology of, of deities in, in a name and a title. That's what, look, I didn't even know the difference of Lord and God before I came in into class. I just, that's his name. That's his name. No, it's not. It's a title, people. Just like my name is Patrick Latortu. That's the name. See, Mr. is a title. Doctor is a title. Teacher is a title. We didn't get to your name yet. You understand? Now I want you to switch. Let's get to the name, please. <laughs> because it will be very funny when you get to the 13th verse. See, God, when I come unto the children of Israel, what am I going to tell you your name? God, that don't make no sense. But go ahead. Read, read out of the King James Version. Let's see how much sense it don't make. Go ahead. Okay. And, Mos and Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, the God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? See how crazy that sounds. God, what's your name, God? Oh, God. Look. And then what? Keep reading. Keep reading the King James. Keep reading. And God said unto Moses, um, I am that I am, or I will be that I will to be. And he now said, you know, no, 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 you did it right the first time. See, <laughs> if you did the King James Version, I am that I am, there should be some burning bush running around here with, with, without without being consumed. That's all he is, a burning bush and an angel in it. No, I'm sorry. He said, I will be what I will to be. And mm -hmm. I implore you to investigate Aya Asha Aya in a strong concordance and, and see what Asher really mean and when you get the full scope of it you'll be like dang that's a that's a creator we serve he will be whatever he will to be for yahweh see it's he who causes to exist whatever exists keep on reading put the true names in there i don't we're not gonna we're not gonna waste too much time i have to get to a point then i need to be quiet go ahead uh, yeah uh starting at 15 and go go and back to 13 let's do the Oh, oh, put, okay, okay. 13. Yes, and Moses said unto Yahweh Elohim, Behold, mm. when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The mm. Elohim of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Yeah. And, uh, and Elohim said unto Moses, I will be what I will to be. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I will be, hath sent me unto you. Yeah. And, El and Elohim said moreover unto Moses, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Yahweh, the Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob hath sent me unto you. Hmm. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. Now, look, that means that name has not changed. If the name has changed, your breath should change as well. For it says in Psalms 150 and 6, say, let everything that has breath praise ye Yahweh. So if, your if, your if his name changed, there will be many people either in the morgue or in the hospital. Pick one. Because you can only breathe the name y'all. You understand? But his name is Lord. I dare you to breathe Lord God 24 hours a day and see you don't end up in some hospital somewhere. You understand? See? Now, let's get this understood as well. 
This name was revealed on the migratory trek in the what? In the holy place. The court roundabout representing Egypt, the holy place representing the wilderness, and Canaan's land representing the most holy place. Now, it was revealed in the holy place. How do you prove this? You go to your pattern. Didn't the, didn't the high priest, when he had to change his garments, didn't he have a mitre that said, holiness under who? Yahweh. Where was that located? In the holy place. You understand what's being said unto you? And if you put up your ages and dispensations chart, do that for one moment, please, before, if you can. Now, I want you to know where the name was revealed. It was not revealed in the antediluvian age. It was revealed in the what? Post-diluvian age. And we're now in the present kingdom age. So if you line up your pattern, the court roundabout, representing the antediluvian age, the post-diluvian age represented in the holy place, and the most holy place, uh, the, and, and the present kingdom age represented in the most holy place, you will note that Yahweh revealed his name to Moses, and it's located where? In the fourth dispensation, in the post-diluvian age. See what's being said unto you? So you see what's being said unto you? So however you want to do this, whether you use your tabernacle pattern, whether you use your ages and dispensations, or you use your not migratory trek, that's where the name was revealed. See? And then he commissioned Moses to bring that name all the way down into what? The land of Egypt. Uh-oh, I'm talking a lot. See? You know what? And, 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 and then Moses did one of those moments. Who am I to go to Pharaoh? What? You want me to do what again? You better give me the fourth chapter of Exodus. Let's do that. I know I'm taking this slow, but I got to get to my point. Four and one, please. And Moses answered and said, but behold, they will not believe me nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say. That's right. That I think they won't believe or hearken unto his voice. Read. Mm -hmm. uh, that Yahweh hath not appeared unto me. That's and right. Yahweh said unto him, what is, what is in thine hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground, and it was cast on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from before it. Mm. And Yahweh Elohim said unto Moses, put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. Now remember, this is how you catch the satanic spirit. Catch him by his tail or by his what? Lie. There's plenty of lies running around here on this earth plane, I tell you that much. You understand? Keep reading. That they may believe that Yahweh, that Yahweh, the Elohim of their fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. Me. And Yahweh said furthermore unto him, put now thine hand into thy, bo thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. Now remember, leprosy represents a death. Say, do some research on leprosy. Go ahead, keep reading. And he five said, minutes, please. Five minutes, please. Five minutes. Yeah, go on it. I knew I couldn't get through all this. Go ahead. With and, he hand. Said, and he said, put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. Listen, that means leprosy, that's a death. He put his hand in his bosom, that's a burial. And it became his other, that's a resurrection. You understand? Don't you understand that typifies Joshua and the Messiah being, um, uh, being, having a specially prepared body so that all the sins of the world will be placed upon him? That's re-representing a death. He went through a burial. They put him in Joseph's new tomb. See? No one's been buried in it. And that he resurrected on the third day. See that? It's a death, a burial, and a resurrection. What is the point I'm trying to get you to see? You understand? I got one more point and I'll try to shut up. See, we, according to this pattern, go through a death, 
a burial, and a resurrection in various manifold manifestations in our life. And if we remember that, a problem being a death, the being buried in the problem, and the solution being the resurrection, you come out of it, you understand? Now, it's no longer, well, look what I did. No, it's not about what, look what you did. Let me, let me remind you in the 14th chapter of Exodus, see, you understand that when the children of Israel, after eating the Pascal lamb, you understand that represents a death, you understand? And see, they had to come to the divider, they had to come to the Red Sea. So they were, that was a principle of a barrier when the Red Sea opened up when Pharaoh was coming after them. And what was the thing they had to see? Give me Exodus 14 and 10. I know I would never finish this. Go ahead. There's too much to talk about. Go ahead. Exodus 14 and 10. Right. And when Pharaoh, what was that? That's right. Keep reading. Okay. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto Yahweh, and they Remember, said, there they, "Wait, wait, wait! Now fear that represents a death." And they cried to Yahweh, "Read." And they said unto Moses, "Because there were no graves in Egypt." Hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Yeah, Therefore, maybe. hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. That's a very bad statement. Egypt is already devastated and you still want to serve the Egyptians? You know I ain't talking about back then. Anyway, keep reading. 13, and Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh. Read Which that again. And, <laughs> Read that again. Fear not, stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh. This he needs will... to be applied now. Because you, as the children of Israel were at the fourth step, so are we according to the ages and dispensations. Keep going, read. Which he will show to you today. Yeah. For the, for, the for the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Read. Yahweh shall fight for you, and ye shall you hold say? your... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Yahweh will do what? what? Yahweh will what? Shall fight for you. Oh! And then what? And ye shall hold your peace. In other words, be quiet. Mm -hmm. Read. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. For the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. So I'm going to have to cut this up since I only have probably 30 seconds. So here's my point. People, this needs to be applied seriously. Now, whatever you're going through, you're looking unto Yahshua. See the salvation of Yahshua. I mean, see the salvation of Yahweh. You see Yahshua's name written right there in the scriptures? Because Yahshua's name means. Yahweh is what? Salvation. You understand? So let us practice these things. Very Because see, there will be more things to come. More devastation to be here. But be of what? Good cheer. For he that is in you is greater than he that is what? In the world. And that's what you must look within for your salvation. For Yahshua, for there, for for you have to know that Yahshua is truly your only hope of glory. And so with these few words, I say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Latortu. And our next speaker this afternoon will be Dr. Cherie Williams from our Orlando, Florida class. Good afternoon and good evening, class. Good evening. You can hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, I thoroughly enjoyed the testimony of the previous speaker, and I am definitely 
honored and privileged to have one more time to come and sit under this great divine vision and revelation that our Heavenly Father, Yahweh Elohim, through Yahshua the Messiah, did give our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kenley, in the year of 1931 in Springfield, Ohio. And after which, he was obedient to Yahshua and went forth and declared this great divine vision and revelation that we might know Yahweh, I owe him, as he really is and as he actually exists, and that we might inherit eternal life right now in the kingdom of Yahshua, the Messiah, right at the brink of the universal revelation of Yahshua, the Messiah. Um, I would like to, for the few minutes that I have, just give a personal testimony. And this personal testimony has nothing to do with Sheree, but it has everything to do with the mercy of Yahweh Elohim through Yahshua the Messiah and his great eternal power that he has manifested in my life. Um, I visit with uh, Oceanside a lot and um, I am almost mirrored to the first speaker um, going to the law of prophets fulfillment of Yahshua, seeing the reality, taking the natural to understand the spirit, because that's what we do. Uh, that is what the preaching of the gospel is saving our souls present tense. Um, however, Yahweh has manifest mercy and power in my life. And I'm a one that don't like to talk about me. But I think at this point in time in my life, uh, I need to share these things because we're right at the end. And for me, this has helped me take these precepts and principles off of the chart, take these precepts and principles out of the Elham book, out of our pamphlets, out of our transcripts, and apply them present tense. And when you can see Yahweh working in your life, and it's not just something that you read in the scriptures, you know what I mean? It, it becomes real to you. So I want to give a personal testimony. This is totally different for me, but I don't want to take uh, these powerful testimonies that Yahweh Elohim Yahshua has given me in my life to the grave. Um, so I, I, I am compelled to share this to further encourage the brethren and hope that one is edified so that he or she can see the power of Yahweh working in their lives. And they have but maybe hadn't tapped into it. Okay, so here we go. It was nine years ago this month when I was in a head-on collision. Right now, today, uh, I have permanent back injuries um, and I have metal in my lower extremities of my body, my, my driving foot, my right foot. Um, I, it was a rainy day. I had just dropped off a client. Uh, I did Seniors Transit Authority, my own business. And I was about two blocks away from home. I was by myself, thank goodness. And this guy came off the interstate, get ready to make a right turn going the opposite direction of me. Uh, there's two lanes going uh, uh, north and two lanes going south and a center turn lane. Well, he came off of the interstate too fast, hit a puddle, hydroplane, came across two lanes, the center turn lane, I'm in the inside lane, approaching the light there with the interstate overpass. So I was driving really slow, approaching a red light. All of a sudden, I see these headlights coming toward me, and I'm thinking, hmm, is he getting ready to make a left turn to that business over there? And it kept coming, kept coming. I'm like, so I kind of backed up and bam hit me head on. 
my airbags exploded. Um, the seat belt held me in. And uh, I was like in a daze because I was like, what just happened? You know, my phone flying everywhere. You know how collisions can be. Well, when the, they showed up, they're walking around the car. I was in a Volvo and um, I heard the police and all the people as they were surveying um, the car saying that, oh, my goodness. And Yahweh made me hear this. They had to have this conversation so I could hear that his power and his mercy is the only reason I was alive that day. Um, they said, thank goodness she was in this Volvo because if she had been in any other American car or smaller compact car, you know, the engine would have gone into the compartment, the driving compartment and crushed her. This is what I'm hearing. And um, then, you know, uh, they put me on a stretcher, took me to the hospital. I'm going into the images. All right. And the guy said, oh, my goodness, you're so black and blue in your torso and your bones all messed up. You know, uh, what happened? Can I ask you what happened? I said, I was in a head on collision. He said, what? And you alive to tell me about it? Girl, you know, there is some angel, some somebody looking out for you, <laughs> you know. Then the police officer comes uh, to the room to do the report. You know how they do the traffic thing for the insurance. And he says, listen, uh, I want you to know it was almost a year ago to the date that this self-same accident happened. But the driver were in the lane that you were in, blew through the windshield because she did not have on her seatbelt. And fell on the pavement in front of the car and died on the scene. He said, you a blessed woman. Most people don't survive head-on collisions. So I'm talking about the mercy of Yahweh and the power of Yahweh manifested in my life. That was nine years ago this month. Now, nine years later, same month. I don't know what's up with me in November. Now I'm facing something very serious once again in November. But uh, what happened was my oldest two children, Gabrielle and Benjamin, they suffered with migraines. I never have. And they have told me about the symptoms and, the, you know, the sensitive to light, sound, nausea, whatever. So um, it started on a Saturday. I actually went to the hospital on the 13th of November. On that Saturday before that, I just had this sick headache and I suffered with high blood pressure. So I just thought my pressure was out of control. I would get those sick headaches and my pressure's too high. And I kept checking my pressure. Pressure is good. But this sick headache, I had it. Tylenol, Motrin, no over-the-counter drugs. Didn't touch it. It was like drinking water. And, and I piled through Saturday doing my routine. You know how we have our routines, right? Got on up, went to class, powered through on that Sunday. But each day that went from Saturday to Sunday, then to Monday, each day it got progressively worse. So Sunday night, I go to bed. I am so miserable. My head hurt so bad. My pillow felt like a brick. It felt like a feather would fall on my head. My head would explode. That's how bad it was. I did not sleep a wink at all that Sunday night the 12th and I tossed and I turned and I tossed and I turned and I got up on that money. I said, Gary, uh, -uh I, I can't, I, I, said, I don't know what it is. Something is wrong, but I can't, I can't handle this anymore. We got to go to the hospital, went to the hospital. And, um, because you have a complaint of your head, they automatically do a CT scan. So, uh, they, they, uh, ordered the CT scan we got there by late morning, 11 o'clock-ish, 10.30, 11, 11.30, somewhere in there. The doctor comes in about 4.30 that afternoon. Uh, but mind you, they did give me what they call a, a cocktail pain punch, you know, in my IV. It's three different medications for pain to get me uh, over that hump of that pain. Because they said from one being the least and 10 being the most, What's, what's the number I would use to describe my pain? I want to say 11. It was so bad. 
And I was so, the head hurt so bad, I was so nauseous and I could not eat. Anyway, so the pain medicine helped. Uh, thank goodness. Hallelujah. And they gave me a steroid shot. I think it was every four to six hours around the clock after that. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Oh. Okay. So um, the doctor came in at, uh, like I said, around 4.30ish or, or whatever and said, well, Miss Williams, we're going to have to admit you. And I'm thinking, what? He said, this, I got the test results back from the CT scan and you have a benign tumor growing in your brain. And we have to admit you, send you up to the neurologist wing because uh, we need to get an MRI tomorrow morning to find out the size, its location, what it's pressing on and whatever, right, for more data. So I'm in my mind, I'm like, shucks, I thought I was just coming to get some migraine medication and go home and go on with life, right? They telling me I got a benign tumor in my brain. I'm like, oh my God. So out on the outside, I'm looking very cool and collective. But on the inside, you know how the cartoons are where the eyes pop out the head and the mouth falls to the ground? That was me on the inside. I'm like, what? Say it ain't so, you know. So anyway, so they uh, they don't have a room. We don't have a room right now, whatever. So I was headed upstairs around about 7.30, 8 o'clock. And um, they got me up and, uh, and, and transport took me to imaging for the MRI around about 5.30 a.m. on that Tuesday. So they do the MRI and everything. And then the neurologist, surgeon, he comes in about 6.30 that Tuesday night, my baby brother is in the room and his wife, my baby daughter, Sarah, she's in the room. And, um, and, and I was glad I had someone there to listen with me. All right. So he describes that this tumor, and I'm trying to see if I can say the name of this thing, it's called Manning, Manning Ioma. I might be saying it wrong. And it is... It is located in the back of my head, on the right side of my neck, inside of the skull. It's about two inches in size. It's pushing the brain up out of its place. And it's located very close to the neck area there. So it's pressing, it's growing, pressing on the brain stem and my spinal cord. Um, so... The surgeon says, look, because of the serious location of this tumor, I don't want to go in with a scaffold. He says, because you have a 50-50 chance. You can come out with flying colors and be fine. Or 50-50 chance you could come out not being able to speak, not being able to swallow, and need a feeding tube for the rest of your life. So in my mind, I'm like, strike one. He has three choices for me. He says, or we can do observation, send you home with pain medication and nausea meds, wait three months, reevaluate you with another MRI in about three months, and uh, see if it has grown any. Well, my son was the first one to say, Ma, no, you already getting ill effects. If it grows any, who knows what other medical issues it'll cause? Can we explore? Uh, what we can do to stop the growth of this thing. It's a very slow, slow growing tumor, but it does grow and cause more pressure in the brain. All right. So um, then the third choice, he said, well, he says, this is not in my area. I'd have to get Dr. Keller, who is a radiation oncologist to come talk to you on Wednesday. And he can give you the details on it, but maybe we can do what they call a potent radiation uh, uh, treatment. It's a one-time treatment on that tumor to stunt its growth. Um, so then um, he left. Then the next day in the evening, around that same time, here comes Dr. Keller, the radiation oncologist. And he says, look, I, I heard what Dr. Rosen said, uh, but I am not going to do that. He said the location of this is very, very serious. He said and that one shot radiation treatment is so potent that 
it could spill over to the brain stem and spinal cord and cause paralysis from the neck down. So I'm like, okay, strike three. And then he says, um, and doing nothing is not a choice either because of its location. If it grows, uh, because it's so close to the brain stem and spinal cord, doing nothing and it grows and put pressure there, that can also cause paralysis from the neck down. So I'm like, oh my gosh, strike four. So then uh, he said, but what I am going to recommend, because we need to stunt the growth of this thing, uh, what they call low dose radiation treatment, where I would get 25 treatments over time, very low dose. Uh, it was going to cause nausea. It's, it's going to cause some swelling back there of the skin, um, some irritation. My hair will come out just in the back where they put the radiation in, and I'm going to feel fatigued. Um, and I had to sign the paper that he explained that to me. And um, so it's supposed to start next week. But my thing is this, that I have been prepared for this. But I didn't know it at the time. Um, many of you all know Angel Williams, Seth Williams, and Nikki Johnson, uh, Unity and Young, and they have the symposium annually. Well, Angel is my youngest daughter, Sarah's best friend. They grew up together like sisters in class. They were both born in class. And um, so... Angel got married in May. My daughter got married in June. And uh, I had to be the mother of the bride, right? So I'm I'm rewinding. This is before all this. Um, so I'm walking a mile a day, Monday through Friday. Get down to size. I got to, you know, got to look good. I'm the mother of the bride. <laughs> Y'all know how it is, right? But uh, Angel's wedding is up right at four weeks before Sarah's wedding. So about two weeks out from, from Angel's wedding, I made up my mind. I'm getting kind of close. Let me just, instead of a mile, let's do a mile and a quarter. Instead of this pace, let's do a little faster. Big mistake. Something triggered, and you know I got permanent back injuries, but this ends up being something else, I'm going to tell you. From my lower back, something this pain shooting from my lower back to my left hip and shooting down my leg. The pain was so severe, I could not sit on the commode. I had to stand in the shower to do number one. I couldn't pull my clothes up or down. My husband had to dress me, undress me. I couldn't wash my lower extremities in the shower. He had to do all this. I was totally and absolutely dependent on him. I can't reach to my left. I got to keep all the pressure off that left hip. And I got to sit with that leg straight. That's the only way I got a little relief. But every single movement that I made, I'm screaming out in pure agony and pain. I end up going to the chiropractor. She did an assessment um, and sent me for imaging. The images came back. A week later, I went in. She got the thing uploaded on her computer. She said, let me show you something. She did an adjustment, the first assessment, which it gave me a little relief. I was able to at least sit up straight. I couldn't even sit up straight. You know, it hurts so bad. Um, and I'm looking at, I said, is that my spine? She said, yes, ma'am. From my neck coming straight down, it comes straight down, and then it gets to the lower back, and it curves out to the left. In other words, I have scoliosis. I was either born that way or it developed in my junior high years. The doctor wasn't sure. It's hard to know without having image referral. You know what I mean? All yeah. right. So um, when she explained it to me, what this pain was on the outside of a curve, you know, like half a, you know, like a half a circle at the tail on the outside of the curve, the bones are spread wide. And she showed it to me. But on the inside of that curve, the bones are squeezing in and narrow and they're pinching nerves that shoot from my lower back to my left hip, down my leg. 
And she said, I knew it was some kind of pinched nerve situation, but I didn't dream it was scoliosis. She said, you didn't know yet? I said, no, had not a clue. She said, we can't fix it. We can't cure it. But all we could do is uh, adjust it and try to get some space between those bones that's pinching those nerves. So I went twice a week. I started getting better. I told her, look, I got to walk down the aisle. I got to be the mother of the bride. I'm the first one to march in. You got to get me where I can at least walk in halfway decent without a cane and not screaming with every step. She said, we're going to get you there. So she did. I started getting better. And um, then they decided to put me on this roller bed. Now, I got to re rewind a minute. When we first came to class, I was a senior in high school, 18. Y'all heard me say that a minute day. 1977. My mother was a second grade teacher at an elementary school and she was wrapping up her day. School was about to be out. She stood up off of her chair to speak to her students in the classroom. Well, not maliciously, but one of the children moved the chair from behind her to take it up to the uh, board to clean her chalkboard for her, you know, because it's getting ready to go into the weekend. All right. She did unbeknownst to mom. She thinks the chair's there. She sits down. She falls right on that tailbone. She is totally and absolutely miserable and ne needed to go to the hospital, but she didn't want to miss class that Friday night. She came to class, and Angel's father, uh, John Williams, we call him a J-Bo, uh, Yashua used his vessel to give mom some relief. And she was standing before the choir. There's a set of chairs on the right, set of chairs on the left, and she's standing in the aisle in front of the choir. He's trying to scoop past her to go around and get in the tenor session. So he put his hand on that lower area of her tailbone. Excuse me, mom, trying to get by. She said she felt Joshua emanate this heat coming from his hand in that area where she was so miserable. And she went, ooh. And then she couldn't tell us how long it lasted. But when the, when the heat went away, no more pain. Yasha has totally healed her right there at class in 1977. So they put me on the roller bed. And this thing is rolling. I've never been to a chiropractor, so I don't know if it's supposed to hurt or what. And that pen kept rolling across my tailbone, across my tailbone, across my tailbone, across my tailbone. When I got there, I was went limping a little. But when I got off of that thing, it injured my tailbone. I said, oh, my gosh. And I could barely walk. I was grunting with pain again. I said, I came in halfway decent. Now I'm leaving worse than I was. And she said, well, on Monday, you were much better. Miss Williams, what's happening? I told her. She said, it wasn't supposed to hurt. You should have got up. I said, I don't know. I never went through this, you know. Totally injured my tailbone really bad. I go home. This is Wednesday. Thursday before Angel's wedding. I'm trying to go get my hair done, whatever. This, she's like my other daughter even though we're not related physically, but she and Sarah grew up together. So I'm, I get up. Oh, I'm, I'm so miserable. I get, I'm walking. I could barely walk. I get in the car very gingerly. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. So I'm driving to the beautician. And I remember about my mom and how Yashua healed her like that uh, using John Williams. So I knew what to ask for. I said, and I prayed a prayer within myself. I'm talking about Yahweh Elohim Yahshua being real. I'm talking about his mercy. I'm talking about his power. That's what I'm talking about. Not about me. It's about him. I prayed this prayer within myself. I said, Yahshua, the great physician that you are. I said, I am so miserable, Yahshua. I am miserable. I am in excruciating pain. They injured my tailbone at the doctor's. I need to feel like healing heat, Yashua. Please have mercy on me. Instantaneously, I line up. There's that heat I feel. It. And it surprises me. Because I'm not expecting him to answer me right now. Answer me right now. I feel this heat. I went, oh, I can feel it. I went, thank you, Yashua. Thank you, Yashua. Thank you, Yashua. I'm, and I'm driving still. I get to the beautician, and I'm still, you know, I, I don't want to doubt Yashua, you know what I'm saying? But I never went through this, you know what I'm saying? So I turn very gingerly, my legs around. I'm climbing out the car very slowly. I'm like, hmm, okay, no pain. 
Lock the door, begin to walk. Oh, I can walk. No pain. Thank you, Yahshua. Thank you, Yahshua. Thank you, Yahshua. I'm talking about his mercy and his power manifest right now. Not tomorrow. Not the next moment. Right then he answered me. All right. So then I make it to her. This is Thursday. Go to her wedding on on uh, on that angel's wedding that Saturday. Everything's fine. Four weeks later, uh, my daughter gets married and everything went fine. All right. We getting ready for the Unity and Y'all Symposium. Um, I am okay. Let me get it right now. We go to the symposium. Well, before the symposium, that's what it was. I had one encounter with a damnable spirit. Before we went to the symposium. And he, you know, Satan and his host, they, they're cowards. So I was like an in-between sleep. You know how you be kind of paralyzed, but you, you're still aware of your surroundings. You can still hear, but you can't speak and you can't move. I was like that. And he attacked me in that state and started choking me and wrestling with me and everything. And, and I, I couldn't fight back. You know, we have, we are no match to damnable spirits. Yahshua is the only one. He casts him out, them out of heaven. He casts them out of men, women, and children as the Messiah. You know what I'm saying? We 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 are no match for no damnable spirit. And all I could do was scream. I, I scream real loud. Then we go to the Unity and Yah Symposium. We were there three nights. One of those nights there, I was attacked again by this, this demon. I screamed the, the second time, scream. Come home. I had COVID fourteen days, um, and uh, he attacked me again. Right, right, right as I was getting over it. This time I didn't just scream. The first two times I screamed. This time I said, "Joshua, please," because I couldn't do nothing with it, you know. And uh, when I called Joshua's name, that demon fled. He just got off of me, gone, and then. I would want to say two or three nights in a row. No issue. I was. I kept saying, thank you, Yashua. Thank you. Now, the only reason I remember this date, because I wrote it down. September the 14th, about four day in the morning, because you know how we do, women. Sometimes we get up early in the morning, go to the ladies' room, come back, maybe sleep another hour or two, right? So I sleep with a with a CPAP because I stopped breathing during the night when I sleep. And uh, I'm a side sleeper, so I normally sleep on my side. But when I begin to arise out of my sleep, sometimes I turn over on my back. Right? So this is two or three days after that last time I was plagued and I called Yashua, Yashua, please. And I'm on my back and I open my eyes and there was Yashua the Messiah. Standing at the foot of my bed, he is as tall as my ceiling, even more so because he's so tall, he had to lean forward toward me. He's looking at me. I'm looking at him. And he's all white from the top of his head all the way down. I couldn't see the feet because of the bed. All white. His raiment was like this on this Moses chart here on the right side. The high priest garments, his raiment was just like that high priest garment, but it was all white, no colors. And so I, I, when I opened my eyes and I saw him, I glanced down the body, right? And I got a glance up the body. I looked, by the time I got back to his face, features didn't matter. I wasn't trying to tap in on that. I was just in total amazement that Yahshua was appearing to me in his incorporeal state in my room. And I go, I'm just looking. When I got back to his face, my heart go pitter patter, pitter patter, pitter patter, pitter patter. Not afraid that he's going to hurt me, but that kind of fear of total respect and reverence, knowing that this is the great creator that is all power in my room, looking dead at me in my face. If I had been standing up, I tell you no lie. I can I can totally relate to through the ages and dispensations of time when he appeared to men and they fell to their face. I would have fallen to my face, you guys. But I'm laying there on my back, 
looking up at him, you know. And all I could do, my heart just pitter patter, pitter patter, pitter patter, pitter patter. I was like, and then he vanished. It's like he didn't say a word. And so he made me to understand that he appeared to me to let me know, first and foremost, at that time, you called on me. I love you. I'm here to protect you from all evil. You don't have to worry about that no more. You'll be able to sleep in peace. He made me to know that. Then two months later in November, now that I'm facing this situation, right? He made me to understand that that appearance was a twofold reason to let me know, yeah, you got something very serious coming up. I love you. I'm your husband. I'm your protector. I'm your comforter. And I got you. You know what I mean? And I have every confidence that Yahweh Elohim Yahshua has me. If Yahshua is not through using me to be a minister of his great gospel, if he's not through using me, I'll still be here. But if Yahshua is done with me, then I won't be here. And either way it falls, it's A-OK -okay with me. Because I have seen his incorporeal. Right? And I don't think I told y'all this. And I didn't say it in Tampa. But Yahshua allowed my mother, this past March, made a year, my mama had taken the flesh off. She was the Orlando uh, dean and the state of, uh, dean of the state of Florida. And that that uh, state of the Florida, you know, dean is, is a type of, I'm just saying a type, because we know the priests were not women. But we are over here nine, male and female and all that don't matter. You know what I'm saying? But he allowed mama to appear to me in my room three weeks after she took the flesh off. I'm talking about the power of Yahweh. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Yahweh Elohim Yahshua is real. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about his mercy. That's what I'm talking about. And so... When my mom first took the flesh off at home, my sister, I'm the oldest, Priscilla's the second oldest, uh, she had got up, did her early routine, used the ladies' room, washed her hands, da da da, and she just dropped, but nobody knew it, right? So I guess maybe a couple of hours or so before my sister found her, but she was in her room and she felt this bump at the foot of her bed. And she opened her eyes, but she didn't see anything. And she realized when she thought back on it later, that was mom. But she couldn't see her. All right. I'm sharing that to say when Yahshua allowed mom to, to come visit me three weeks after her passing, um, I was sitting up. I have acid reflex. I'm just a mango seed, right? Ragged as a mango seed. I take my bedtime meds. I sit up on my pillows, 90 degrees, to allow my medicine to go down. I have acid reflex. And I got my eyes closed. So I'm not asleep. All of a sudden, I feel this bump at the foot of the bed. Same thing Priscilla felt when she first took the flesh off. So I opened my eyes. There was mom. All white. Just like I said that Yahweh on him, Yahshua was. Yahshua was when he appeared. She's all white. Kind of like if you ever saw the movie Casper the Ghost. White, but tr translucent. That's how they are. And, um, and I, I recognize I sat up in bed and I put my arms out for a hug. I said, mommy, mommy, I love you. I love you. I miss you. I miss you. And I'm reaching for a hug, right? Now, this is before. This is, you know, a, a year and a half ago. All right? And do you know Yahshua took my soul out of my body and stood it there in the middle of my room? And I'm looking at mom's soul leaning over my physical body in bed, hugging me. My soul is over there looking. And I'm like, my goodness, right? Then he, he got my soul, put my soul back in my body. And when I opened my eyes, I could see mama's head laying on my chest, right? Like I said, white but translucent. And I could see my chest through her head because this is her soul, her spirit. 
and she's hugging me. And you guys, I, I listen, and this is mom. This is not even Yahshua the Messiah. But the joy, the peace, the righteousness that emanated from her soul just confident me. And I just, I was looking down at her. And then next thing I know, I drifted on off to see it was so peaceful. And I mean, that's just a drop in the bucket to the peace, joy, and righteousness that we have to look forward to at the universal revelation of Yashua. Just a drop in the bucket. And another thing, too, with him appearing to me, I'm talking about Yashua now on the 14th of September. Um, with this that I'm facing, this very serious thing that I'm facing, um, it's scary. I know he has me. He let me know that he has me. But when you go into those big old machines and they're loud, and they're taking all this stuff and stuff, it's the unknown. I never went through nothing like this. It's the unknown. You don't know what you're going to feel. During it, you don't know what you're going to feel after it. You don't know what they expect. You know what I'm saying? So there's some anxiousness involved just from a natural standpoint. You know what I mean? So every time I'm going through all these different tests I've had to go through um, in the last two weeks here, um, I just close. When I get anxious, I close my eyes. And with my inner eye, I see Joshua standing there at the foot of my bed all the way up to the ceiling. And he's leaning forward because he's taller than the ceiling. He's leaning forward toward me like an overshadow light. I tell you, and then when I see that image in my mind's eye, as I'm I'm a little anxious, and then I just feel this calm come over me. Just calm me right on down, and I'm okay. So, so that was to help me get through this time. And one more testimony, I'm done is that it was, I want to say, um, it was before this, before all of this, I'm rewinding. I'm kind of going backwards. I'm going from the tomb when I'm going backwards, right? Um, I had a very bad bladder infection, real bad. It involved my tub tubes coming from the kidney on my right side of my body and involved my kidney itself, went to the doctor. They put me on antibiotics and they put me on this pain medicine that's like a brown pill. And the lady, she, the, my doctor, she warned me, say, look, you know, once this get in your system, don't be alarmed. Uh, your urine is going to be very dark. Right. She warned me. All right. But when the deal went down and I saw it, it still startled me. I went, oh, my gosh, it was frightening. Right. So I go in the room. And uh, once again, propped up on my pillows, let my medicine go down because my acid reflex. And this is before I see him and see my, you know, I was after mom, but before I saw him. I hear this voice. Cherie. I'm looking around. I don't see nothing. I'm like, hmm. And I'm not sure. Did I hear that right? Or I'm what? Am I imagining things? I didn't say nothing. Then he said, Cherie, I'm looking around. So now I still don't say nothing, dodo head, stupid old, you know what I'm saying? I just raised my eyebrows in amazement, like, is Joshua speaking to me? And he sees I kind of you're perked up, but I didn't open my mouth. He says, I see you are concerned about the color of your urine. And I go, well... Not really. She did warn me. But at the end of the day, I really was. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm the oldest child. I helped raise my siblings. I raised my children. I helped raise my grands. And being the firstborn, you know, you know, you got to be kind of tough like. But let me tell y'all something. It is A-OK -okay to feel vulnerable, to feel frightened, to feel unsure. Oh, I can't think of the adjectives I want to use. In front of the creator. I mean, I couldn't see him. I only heard him. He knew how I felt, you know. All right, I go to class, in-person class. My childhood friend, we grew up together in one part of Florida, Janitha Cleveland. She got called that Sunday, and uh, 
she's going her discourse. Then she get toward the end of her discourse and she says, when Yahweh calls your name, she's talking to somebody way on the opposite side of the room. And I'm, and I'm realizing Yahshua is wrong with me, very upset because I didn't answer him when he called my name. Now, you know, he said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I, right? He called Samuel when he was a little boy. Samuel, he went and asked the, the guy, you know what I'm saying? Did you call me? No, I didn't call you. He said, go on back to bed. Samuel, he go back. Did you call me? No, I didn't call you. This time, if he called you, just say, here am I. And he did. And all through the book, you see that, they answer. My dodo, dumb dumb, you know, I did. I was just like in a state of shock. I didn't answer. But he was upset with me. So he's speaking through my best friend that I grew up with from a child, my childhood friend. And I recognized it wasn't her, it was Joshua. And she's speaking to somebody way on the other side of the room, our in-person class on Sunday. Say, when Yahweh calls your name, what are you going to say? And she made the person who she calls. And they just looked. She said, you say, here am I. Then she called a second person. Asked them the same thing. And then they answered, here am I. Then the third person. Here am I. And got all the way to me, I was last. Cherie, when he calls your name, what are you going to say? I said, here am I. And <laughs> I realized Yasha was upset with me. And I had to apologize. When I left that class, my heart was broken. I said, I'm so sorry, Yasha. I'm so sorry. My, my mama taught me. Somebody call your name, you answer. You know, but I was just like, what? Is he speaking to me? You know, but uh, yeah. So if you hear Yasha call your name, please say, here am I. Because he don't appreciate it when you don't answer. He chastened me in class that day. And I recognized it was Yasha. He was wrong at me. And I did apologize for not answering him. You know, when he called me. So I'm just sharing these things to say to you that, listen, what we're learning down here by this divine vision and revelation, it is not a fairy tale. Yahweh Elohim Yahshua is very real, working in your life. He may not speak out to you like I heard him call my name out like that. Sometimes it feels like a thought, Right. And then if you follow through with it, you'll see he's answering a question or two or something like that. You know what I mean? Some people hear him speak out in his voice. Sometimes it's a thought. But it's still Yahshua speaking to you, teaching you, leading and guiding you in your every walk of life. And I know each and every one of you, if you look back over your life, even before coming to class, you can see his hand leading and guiding you through your life, protecting you. You know, many a time uh, we should have been dead. But his mercy and his power has protected us all our lives. That's why we read in the scripture that uh, uh, that he girded us even when we didn't know him. You know what I mean? But I did, I did not want to go to my grave, if that be the case in this case, without sharing those things with my brethren that I love so much and so dear. Because I want you to know he is real. I have seen him. I have seen my mom's incorporate. I have seen Yashua's incorporate. Right in my little room. I'm a nobody and a nothing in the overall scheme of things in Yahweh's divine purpose, pattern, or plan of salvation. I am a nothing. Less than what the bird left on the limb. Less than a grain of sand. You get what I'm talking about? And I realize that. But nevertheless, he has manifest his mercy and his power in my life. And I want to leave that testimony with my brethren uh, by way of encouragement. Don't get weary. Don't get tired. You know what I'm saying? It's hard sometimes. You know what I mean? We go through this, that, and tell them whatever it is. It's all right. The scripture says you ain't suffered unto blood striving against sin. None of us. Yahshua spilled his blood and he was the innocent man. You know what I mean? He ain't had no sin. We the sinners. You know what I'm saying? But by the grace of Yahweh through Yahshua the Messiah, by the preaching of the unadulterated gospel of Yahshua the Messiah, our souls are being washed white in the blood of Yahshua the Messiah every single class. He is doing that for us. He is translating us right now into his kingdom. Giving us eternal life right now. 
We've been translating. And, I, and I've said it so many times. I heard Dr. Kenley say on SoundCloud. Enoch was translated. Go to the Ages and Destination chart, please. I hope this is helpful to, to my brother. In the antediluvian age, you had Enoch. He was translated without seeing death. In the post-diluvian age, you had Elijah. He was translated without seeing death. And over here, where we are in the present kingdom age, we are translated into the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah without seeing death. You get what I mean? So can I do, if, if I might, just for a few minutes, can you please get for me, I hope you have it, volume one, the introduction, page one, bottom paragraph, did it ever occur to you? That's what I want. And if somebody else can get volume four, uh, page 55, I did that once before. I just want to share this because, you know, I came up in church and most of us came up in church. You know what I mean? And, you know, our preachers, ministers, pastors, whatever, they were like one scripture scholars, you know, and, and, and taught us we were new New Testament Christians and kind of find out the New Testament is not written uh, in the Bible in the first place, but they had us thinking that. And, and we over there reading around Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and they had no understanding. Listen, it's over there in Revelations where John the Revelator said that he wept much because no one was found worthy in heaven or in earth to open the seven seals of the scriptures and read them. He, they, he he asked this one to read him. He asked that. Nobody could read it. He wept much. But Yahshua, uh, Yahweh told him, say, look, we not for, if I, I, I might quote it wrong, that, but Yahshua the Messiah, the Lamb of the tribe of Judah, he shall loose the seals and, 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 and open the book there of something. Like, I, I'm not quoting it verbatim, but y'all know what I'm talking about. Yes. So, and I listened to uh, tape 31, I think it was last night or this morning. And Dr. Kenley was talking about the keys to the kingdom. We're talking about being translated into the kingdom right now. He said the keys to the kingdom are the law and the prophets. Now, we know Moses is accredited of writing the first five books, which equal the law, right? Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and do Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Let me do it right. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Five books, that's the law. Then the prophecy from Joshua, truly Joshua to Malachi, 34 books. That's the prophecy. Or 39 books is one volume. I think the previous speaker had it read where Joshua said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of Joshua to do thy will, O Yahweh. So he said that the law and the prophets are the keys to the kingdom, take 31. And he says, with, key point, with, the interpretation of Yahshua, the Messiah, taking us by the hand by this vision and revelation to lead and guide us. Because he talked about how that the world, they go in there and they reading around, reading around, trying to study this. They don't even know what to look for. They don't know what the gospel is. They don't know what the precepts are. They don't know Yahshua instituted and fulfilled like the previous speaker said. They don't know none of it. You get what I mean? But I want to leave you with, with this, is that this is a school. We're not in church. We're not new New Testament institutors or class members, if you want to say. You understand? No. We got to go to the law and the prophets. That's not my words. That's what Yahshua said. Now, before you read that, I just want to quote these. And, and I always say, when you go to school, when we went to school, we had to have our textbook. We had to have our notebook. We had to have a pen or pencil to make notes. And so this school is no different. We got to uh, take notes. Don't write down the words people say. Just write the scriptures down and then go check it out later and verify and know it for yourself. But here it is. Yahshua by his divine vision and revelation pointed out. In Exodus 7 and 1, Yahweh told uh, 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 Moses, I have made thee a God unto Pharaoh, right? And we know that Yahweh, who is the one and only true God, he is universal spirit, what? Law. So Moses is a type of the law. And he said, Aaron shall be thy prophet. 
So when Moses and Aaron go down into the land of Egypt, they gathered the elders of the children of Israel first and told them what thus said Yahweh. Then he went in on to Pharaoh in uh, Exodus, the fifth chapter, and told him what thus said Yahweh. So Yahweh would tell Moses in Joshua, the son of Nun, right? Then Moses would tell Aaron, and then Aaron would tell uh, Pharaoh what thus said Yahweh. Not what thus said Moses or what thus said Aaron. But what does said Yahweh, right? So they represent the law and the prophets. We read it all the time, Isaiah 8 and 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. We don't want to just quote that scripture and don't obey it. It's just like uh, uh, having a, a recipe and you got your ingredients there. And you don't follow, and that's your pattern. Right. To make a cake or whatever it is. You know what I'm saying? You got the recipe. You read it out loud, but you don't do it. You do whatever and the thing don't come out right. So we don't want to just quote Isaiah 8 20, but we got to practice it. OK, that's those are the keys to the kingdom with the interpretation of Yahshua the Messiah by this divine vision and revelation. John 5 39, he had to quote it. Uh, search the scriptures, that's the so-called Old Testament, for they are they which testify of me. He, you go down further in that chapter, he says, uh, you, you believe in Moses, believe also in me, because Moses wrote of me, but ain't no Jesus back there in the first five books of the Bible. But you read about a man named Joshua, no J is really Joshua. You get what I mean? Like he said, he was instituting with, back there with Moses and children of Israel, born through the lawns of the virgin, fulfilling. You get it? Then you go over to Lazarus, that's Luke 16, 19, talking about Lazarus and the rich man. And uh, Lazarus died, was put in the bosom of Abraham, which represents Yahweh as a, in this parable that Yahshua is sharing with the people, written in red. But then the rich man died and he was buried and in hell he uh, lifted up his head. And then you go all the way down to the 29th verse of that 16th chapter of Luke. And, and the rich man said, look, I have five brothers at home. Can you please send Lazarus to my father's house to warn my five brothers of this horrible place? And Father Abraham, representing Yahweh, says, no, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He said, no, no, but if one raised from the dead and go tell my brothers, they'll hear him. And Father Abraham said it again. Look, they have Moses and the prophets. If they don't hear Moses or the law and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if one raised from the dead. Stressing this law and prophets. And it's just like he had read in Luke 24, 27. Joshua, after his resurrection, he resurrected the quickening spirit of spirit of God. He said, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets. Now, when you begin at Moses, that don't mean you got to begin at his birth. Anywhere in the first five books of the Bible is beginning at Moses because Moses is the accredited writer of the first five books. Okay? You don't have to begin at the birth. That's all good. And I'm not knocking that. But you could grab whatever principle. It, say, for instance, it's Passover. Run that law cross fulfilled. You know, baptism, whatever. Okay. So now we're talking about how that the law and the prophets are the keys. Do you have that? Did it ever occur to you? Are you there? Yes. Uh, let me okay, find go ahead. Okay. It's on page one. Go ahead. And it's in the last paragraph in the middle. Did it okay. ever occur to you that we remain ignorant of attested truth and scientifically proven facts, most particularly because we fail to make a personal, detailed investigation of important matters? Okay. See, now that's the question. Did it ever occur to you? That we remain ignorant. Now the previous speaker had it read. In John 17 and 3. Or quoted. That eternal life is to know. Yahweh our Elohim. As he really is and actually exists. You know what I'm saying. That's the first aim and John 17 and 3. You know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. All right. So now did it ever occur to you. That we remain ignorant. Of, of a tested truth. What do you mean a tested truth. We've seen. The death, burial, resurrection coming all the way down through the ages and dispensations of time. We've seen blood, water, spirit, form coming all the way down. We've seen how each of these topics in your in your in your um, tabernacle, 
You can run blood. You can run water. You can run spirit. You can run light. You can run door. You can run bread. You can run intercession or prayer. You can run unity of the spirit. You understand? Law, prophecy, fulfillment, reality. All those things. That's attested truth. It never fails. It, it just repeats itself and repeats itself and repeats itself. And and then now it's a test of truth now. Did it ever occur to you that, go ahead, honey. That Did it ever occur to you that we remain ignorant of a tested truth and scientifically proven facts, most particularly because we fail to make a personal, detailed investigation of important matters? Because we this fail to make a personal detailed investigation of important matters. We failed to do that. But now that we are in this school, sitting under this divine vision and revelation, we don't want to fail to do that. Go ahead. This failure to investigate positively retards the progress of our understanding and knowledge in every vocation and phase of life. This Both failure to investigate positively Retards, you need to look those words up. The progress of our, what does it say, growth, honey? Our understanding and knowledge. Our understanding, and it, it, it retards our understanding and knowledge because we failed to investigate. This is mm -hmm. a school. We're not sitting in church. You get it? Go mm -hmm. ahead. And it didn't say only on spiritual. Mm -hmm. um, knowledge. Said, in every vocation and phase of life. In both every vocation. I want to stress that. In every vocation and phase of life. What does that mean? Na this school is to help us from a natural standpoint as well as a spiritual standpoint. Yes, spirit takes preeminence. But we have to live in this life. And this school is to help us now and after we take off the flesh. I'm talking about the sons now. You get what I mean? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Both physical and spiritual. You see that? Both mm -hmm. physical. This teaching is to help us both physical and spiritual. We say it all the time. It takes the natural to understand the spirit. We preach it all the time. Romans 1, 19 and 20. Go ahead. Sometimes stopping and thinking for a moment over the essential things of life eliminates many regretted years of poverty. Okay, Six I'm going to be buttoning in right there. Okay. Sometimes stopping and thinking intelligently. You know, we couldn't even think intelligently before we came to class. Mm -hmm. In other words, Yahshua had to pose the question. Y'all know how it is. Then he turned right around and answer the question. Because we were so ignorant and so deceived, we didn't even know how to even formulate an intelligent question to the great creator to even begin to know him. <laughs> read that part again sweetie sometimes stopping and thinking for a moment over the essential things of life eliminates many regretted years of poverty it, 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 listen to this eliminates sometimes mm -hmm. stopping and thinking intelligent eliminates many regretted years of what poverty poverty you mean I didn't have to be poor <laughs> <laughs> That freaked me out, you guys. First time I read that, I'm like, whoa, because I'm a poor person, right? <laughs> That's why I love Zoom, because I, I like to visit the brethren, but I can't afford to buy a ticket and fly there. <laughs> but now mm -hmm. I can, I could be in any Zoom that Yahshua allowed me to be in. Well, not during my sickness, but, you know, but y'all know I've been, I've been front and center about three years now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I love it, because I get to visit the brethren, and my poor behind can do it right in my living room, a couple of digits. Yay, thank you, Yahshua. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> we're yeah. circulating, we're sharing the lamb, the blood circulating throughout the body of Yahshua Messiah. I'm talking about his spiritual blood. You get what I'm talking about? I love it, love it, love it. But I couldn't afford it. But see, not the mistake I'm gonna share this, that I made physically so, thinking that tomorrow ain't coming. And we know time is short. Things that I maybe could have and should have pursued physically to sustain myself, I did not do that. You understand me? But I didn't let my three children make that mistake and they're all college grads and they're okay. I didn't want them to struggle like mama struggling. You get what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. so uh uh thinking and and uh intelligently over these no 
read that part of it. Regretted uh-huh. years, the regretted years right there. Yep. Regretted years of poverty, sickness, humiliation, embarrassment sometimes, death and destruction. Now, there- just thinking intelligently, we could avoid poverty. List them again. We could avoid mm-hmm. poverty. And what else? Sickness. We can avoid sickness. Humiliation. We can avoid uh, avoid humiliation or embarrassment. Just thinking intelligently mm-hmm. before making a decision on something. Go ahead. Embarrassment sometimes. Death and destruction. We can avoid death and destruction by just stopping and thinking intelligently. Go ahead. Yep. Therefore, we should learn to pause and, and try to think intelligently before we finally conclude affirmatively or negative negatively. Yeah, before you, you make a decision pro or con, mm-hmm. check it out thoroughly. Go ahead. We should do this before an ultim, ultimate, uh, uh, ultimatum. ultimatum. Yep, or, sorry. Or final decision is rendered on any secular subject. In any secular subject, natural or spiritual. Go ahead. The majority of us are, to some extent, guilty of this negligent. There it is. Guilty of this negligence. You get what mm-hmm. I mean? So mm-hmm. I just want to share that because when I read that, that that really stuck out to me. I was like, wow. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we we preach Romans 1, 19 and 20 all the time, but I never applied it like that. But, you know, hallelujah. Thank you, Joshua. You know, uh, 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 before I got up out of here, I, I finally came around to that a little bit. So I just want to share that. But one last thing, I got five minutes. And let me say this. Let's go to, um, let's go to Peter. I know I, I asked for the other, but the volume four, I don't have time. Volume four, page 55, I shared that before. What those are, are topics uh, in the Elohim book. Because Yahshua t- took us by our hand, by this vision and revelation to teach us how to go in and study, how to go in and preach this thing the correct way. He set it up, law of prophecy, fulfillment, reality. He set it up, take the natural to understand the spirit. He set it up, the, the going to the migratory pattern and the, and the tabernacle pattern and run those principles down through the ages. He did that. That's not my rule and regulations. That's what Yahshua said. You get what I'm saying? All right. So now I want to go to Peter. This was at the symposium. Second uh, Peter 3. Uh, I think it's, let's pick up nine. And I want to run this real quick and I'm done. Okay. Nine. Yahweh is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. But Yahweh all- don't, Yahweh's not willing that any should perish. And let me say this. Remember in the vision pamphlet, Dr. Kelly talks about he saw the master plan. And we've been talking about that in Oceanside in different classes, you know, Texas, wherever, you know, about uh, 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 a predestination. And it's true. Mm-hmm. Master plan. But you know what, you guys, what y'all should make me understand? That's Yahweh's lane. We don't know who he chose. We don't know who he elected. That's not our lane. Hmm? Our lane as minister of, of Yahshua's side is to preach the unadulterated gospel of Yahshua's side to save souls. Who he picks and chooses, that's Yahweh's business. That's not our business. And I ain't worried about that. Because I can't see that. He didn't allow that. That's why Romans 1, that which may be known of Yahweh, he ain't letting us see. You don't know everything about mom and dad. You get what I'm talking about from a physical standpoint. You ain't going to know everything about Yahweh. That's his master plan. We can't worry about predestination. That's his lane. His lane. That's not our lane. Our job is to preach the gospel. You understand? That's why he told the disciples, the Great Commission, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father Yahweh, the word of Son Elohim, in the name of Yahshua Messiah. All nations. See, that's our job. We ain't worried about that. But go ahead, honey. Go ahead. Uh, Yahweh is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but mm-hmm. is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Mm hmm. But the day of Yahweh will come as a thief in the night. Keep going. Yes, keep going. In which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The Mm -hmm. earth also and the works that are in it shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. 
This is the what manner of persons ought ye to, to okay. be in all and then hold it right there, baby. See and then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and conduct? Mm -hmm. Now, now I only got two minutes, but what I wanted to tap in on all, all holy conversation and conduct. And Yahweh took me back in my heart and mind with Noah. Do you know he saw in the vision who gonna be saved? When he had the vision, he didn't have no children. He saw it was only he and his family. But did that stop Noah from preaching to the people? No. He did his job. He preached 120 years to the people. You understand? That it was going to rain. And on take 31, he goes into that. They didn't know that tons and tons of water was up there. He preached it no matter what. You got lots. You understand? When, when, the, when, when, when the angels, two angels, like unto the law and the prophets, came to his house down there in Sodom, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, you get it? And they wanted the angels. And we want the men. He offered his virgin daughters. We're talking about all holy conduct and conversation. These things that were penned are for examples unto us and to admonish us. And the question would be, would you be like Noah and they picking at you? Would you preach to them anyway? Would you be like Lot, offer up your virgin daughters? That's a hard one. You know what I'm saying? We're talking about all holy conversation and conduct. Seeing these things shall be dissolved. You got Joseph. They hated Joseph because of his dreams and his coat of many colors. But at the end of the day, when his brothers came down there seeking food in Egypt, did he say, I ain't giving you Jack because you want to kill me and put me in a pit and you hated me? No, he fed them and made sure the king gave them the best land, all holy conduct and conversation. Job, he kept his integrity, though he lost everything, all his flocks and all his children. And at the end of the day, it was twice Three times as much. Jonah, you understand? What did he do? He said, if you want peace on this ship, you just got to cast me overboard. We're talking about the Holy Spirit in a man. That's what I'm talking about, y'all. Talking about Yahshua in a vessel. If you want peace, cast me overboard. Would you do that for strange folks you don't know? Because you've been hard-headed and you know you've been hard-headed. That's what y'all say. Would you? Would you do like Noah? Would you do like Lot? Would you do like Joseph? Would you do like Job? Would you do like Jonah? Then Yahshua Messiah himself. You understand? He, uh, he he didn't have to allow his creatures to crucify him. But he did that because he loved us. He died for our sin. Because when they came to get him in the garden, all he did was turn and say, whom do you seek? And the men fell back as dead men. That's the great creator in the body. He ain't got to let his creatures uh, crucify him. But he did that for the love of us. You understand me? And then in our age, Acts the seventh chapter, you got Stephen preaching to the folks. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, all the way down, Acts the seventh chapter. And at the end of the day, they began to stone him. They were stopping up the ears and everything. And that's Stephen in that present age we're in, preaching down. They stoned him to death. And what did he say? Just like Yahshua on the cross said, Yahweh forgive them, for they know not what they do. You understand? And Stephen. Yahweh forgive them. They know not what they do. And they stone at him to death. And he said he saw Yahshua on the right hand of the throne of the majesty of Yahweh. So when we look at these examples of these holy men down through the ages and dispensations of time, you get it? All holy conversation and conduct. We must love one another, look out for one another, and be helpers together of one another in this great gospel. All uh, honor and all glory go to Yahweh our Elohim through Yahshua the Messiah our Savior hallelujah hallelujah thank you Dr. Williams we'd like to thank everybody who joined us today in our Zoom class and we'd also like to thank those who have viewed us on YouTube we hold our Zoom class every Saturday from 4 to 6 p.m. Pacific time at this time, I'd like to ask the class to stay muted until the live stream has ended. We'll now be dismissed by the doxology, which is taken from the last two verses of the book of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, Belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah.